Welcome back to Every Naval Battle in History. In this one, Athens pulls out a surprise last gasp victory to stay in the knockdown, drag out Peloponnesian War, and then goes and biffs the aftermath. We are relitigating the Battle of Argonusai, 406 BCE. Sometimes the battle is interesting, sometimes the politics. In this case, both are quite fascinating. To set the scene, the up-and-coming Lysander had a very good year as Spartan Navarch. Having convinced the Persian satrap Cyrus, Cyrus the Younger, a son of Darius II, to fund the conflict against Athens, he'd also defeated the dangerous Alcibiades and forced him back into exile. In the process, Lysander also forced the capable Athenian leaders Thrasybulus and Theramenes to the sidelines. But the Spartans did not trust their new admirals and were very unsure how to manage rivers of Persian gold into a society which had not used coined money before. Spartan nobles preferred to do their trade in land and slaves, and if a transaction was worth less than a human life, what even was the point of it? So after his successful year, Lysander was on the bench, and having come from low birth was unloved by the Spartan powers. They were hoping that their man Callicratus could do just as well, proving they didn't need Lysander to win. As an aside to the influence of Lysander on history, let's bear in mind these words from the quick march of the Grenadier Guards. Some talk of Alexander, and some of Hercules, of Hector and Lysander, and such great names as these. But of all the world's brave heroes, there's none that can compare with a tau rao 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 to the British Grenadiers. Uh, excuse me, my poor reading, please. Putting Lysander in the same company as the demigod Hercules, Alexander the Great, and Hector of Troy. He also had a special operations plane named after him, the Westland Lysander, which excelled at taking off and landing from short rough fields in the Second World War. Big shoes for Callicratus to step into. Not helped with the Persian gold drying up when Lysander returned it all to Cyrus, on the basis it was given to Lysander in particular, and not Sparta in general. Despite this difficulty, Callicratus succeeded in bottling the main Athenian fleet under Conon up in Mytilene, on the island of Lesbos, off the Turkish coast. Conon was having problems crewing his ships, and was desperately afraid the townsfolk of Mytilene were going to murder his men in the streets, as had been becoming an increasingly common occurrence as the war went against the Athenians. On learning of this plight, the Athenian assembly took desperate action. They melted down holy golden statues, in particular the winged victory Nike, to make coins. More drastic still, they offered freedom to any slaves willing to crew their new fleet. Every able-bodied man in the city was pressured to take an oar. In the words of Xenophon, Every man of ripe age, whether slave or free, was impressed for this service, so that within 30 days the whole 110 vessels were fully manned and weighed anchor. Miraculously, they managed to build and scratch crew a force of 150 triremes once other reinforcements had arrived. Dangerously, they split the command amongst eight generals. Aristocrates, Aristogenes, Diomedon, Erisinides, Lysias, Pericles, the younger, Protomachus, and Thrasyllus. Just a note, at this time the Athenians still used a generic word, strategoi, for commanders on both land and sea. Sparta had invented the word Navarch for what we today would call an admiral. The Athenian fleet sailed to the Argonusai Islands, just a stone's throw from the Turkish coast and within sight of Mytilene. Callicratus was hoping to get stuck into them at night, having spotted their signal fires, but a thunderstorm forced him to wait until morning. The Athenians, with 150 ships, slightly outnumbered the Spartans' 140. But the Spartans at this point were the experienced mariners, while the Athenians were literally scratch crewed by townsfolk and slaves. It was the largest battle ever fought between Greek navies. Ship for ship, the Spartans were many times over a match for the Athenian emergency fleet. But sadly for them, they had yet to master command of fleets at sea. The Athenians were expecting that the Spartans would use their better trained oarsmen to pull off the manoeuvre known as the Diekplus, where an attacking ship would pass between the ships in the battle line and then make a sharp turn to ram the side of an enemy ship. To counter this, the Athenians deployed in a staggered double line, 
so that if a Spartan ship attempted to turn into an Athenian one, it would in turn be presenting its sides to a ship from the second row. The Athenians also made good use of the islands to prevent the faster Spartans from getting around their flanks. It almost feels as if the Spartans had to learn every single lesson of naval warfare the hard way. Callicratus was killed in the fighting, and the Spartans lost 70 ships to the Athenian 25. Just across the water at Lesbos, another force of 50 Spartan ships was still bottling up Conon and the proper Athenian fleet. The victorious Athenians set off to destroy the smaller force and free Conon, leaving their drowning sailors from the 25 lost ships in the water. The odd couple of Thrasybulus and Theramenes were ordered to see to the survivors. A storm stopped either of these actions being completed. The Spartans got away and the sailors drowned. Thrasybulus and Theramenes returned to Athens with six tons of body parts of drowned sailors and facing a very angry mob set about protecting their own names by throwing the eight commanders under the bus. This time, dead sailors in far seas mattered to Athens. It wasn't just lower class oarsmen lost, it was people they knew. Farce in Athenian democratic politics now piled upon farce. The eight commanders were accused of capital crimes for letting the sailors drown. For what it's worth, I'd have done the same thing as them and gone after the rump Spartan force as well. Two of these eight commanders, Aristogenes and Protomachus, sensibly ran for their lives. The rest came home thinking they'd clear their names in a fair trial. Privilege can have its pitfalls. Powerful people sometimes believe fair trials exist. The philosopher Socrates was called on to conduct the trials, but refused on the basis that mass trials were unlawful. The mob just kept going, and the six generals were executed. Remorse then set in, and the prosecutors were also charged with capital crimes. They were not so foolish as to try and clear their names in a fair trial, and ran for their lives. The effect of all these executions and counter-executions in the wake of what should have been a celebrated victory was that there were very few competent Athenians who wanted to take their chances in leadership roles going forward. Strap in, folks. We've got lots more to cover as we take on every naval battle in history. Smash those like and subscribe buttons. You don't want to get left behind.